Hi, welcome back to Psychology as a Human Science. This video will be the first in a series of two or three videos about transpersonal psychology. So in our last video, what we did was we successfully completed the material on existential psychology by looking at a sequence of nine existential thinkers and noting what they had to contribute to the domain of existential psychology. In this video, we're going to be looking at, like I said, something called transpersonal psychology. Now, probably the easiest way of getting into the material for transpersonal psychology is to recognize that it's basically an offshoot of humanistic psychology. So it's going to have a lot to do with some of the main themes in humanistic psychology with a certain kind of emphasis on some of them and not others. Okay, so transpersonal psychology in your notes began in the late 1960s as an offshoot of humanistic psychology and consequently it's sometimes known as fourth force psychology. Okay, so when we were in the humanistic psychology material, we noted that that's often called third force psychology. Of course, the first two forces, recall, are psychoanalysis and behaviorism. So humanistic psychology would be the third force. And now this thing, transpersonal psychology, is going to be the fourth force. All right, so transpersonal psychology, beginning in 1967 with Abraham Maslow. Wait a minute, you know this guy's name. Well, who is this guy again? He was one of those most three famous humanistic psychologists we looked at in the humanistic psychology videos. Okay, so he was the guy that originated this idea of self-actualization and of course Maslow's hierarchy of needs, among other things. So that's just a reminder for you. So began in 1967 with Maslow's claim that humanistic psychology really needed to address what he called the trans human dimension more. The idea that there's something beyond ourselves the way we normally think of ourselves. Okay, so transhuman sort of means uh, across, well literally from the Latin roots it means like across the human or uh, I guess a little bit more loosely beyond the human. Okay, so a kind of beyond the human mode of psychology. So uh, transhuman I guess it was thought was kind of an awkward phrase, a little bit of a ungainly <laughs> way of talking, so it kind of quickly uh, got translated to the transpersonal, but they mean basically the same thing. All right, so transpersonal means beyond the personal, beyond our usual sense of ourselves. So the question at this point is, what is our usual sense of ourselves about? Okay, so the way uh, Maslow and these early transpersonal types were thinking about it is in terms of uh, the territorial self, the hierarchically organized self, and the egoic self. So our normal way of thinking about ourselves is a composite of those, all right, a combination of those. So the territorial self means uh, our sense of ourselves organized in terms of what we think of as ours, in other words, ownership, what is mine in some sense. And uh, so uh, in other words, uh, territorial just means in terms of the territory, as it were, that we would uh, lay claim to. And the idea here is that in laying claim to territory, there's an implicit claim to being a certain kind of self with certain kind of boundaries and certain kinds of rights and so on. So uh, transpersonal psychology is going to have to do with what lies beyond all of that. Okay, because there's more to us than just the territory that we would lay claim to, right? Or what we think of as ours. There's more to us than that. The hierarchically organized self means as the phrase I think suggests, organized in terms of hierarchies. Like, and I gave you some examples in your notes, like organizing our sense of ourselves in terms of like stuff I like as opposed to stuff I don't like. What I regard as good as opposed to what I regard as bad. And stuff I believe in as opposed to stuff I don't believe in. Okay, so all of those are sort of hierarchical arrangements of, of values and perceptions and habits and all of that. Well, our normal sense of ourselves is, to some fair fraction, organized around things like that, like what we gravitate toward and what we do not, people that we like and people that we do not. All of that is an implicit way of defining who it is we think we are. Okay, and finally, the egoic self means organized in terms of ego. 
Dang, these names are pretty straightforward, aren't they? Almost as though if I were to ask you about them on a test, you could fairly easily just sort of take the name and sort of unpack it a little bit and you would pretty easily find the correct answer on a test. Uh, not that would be relevant to your life in the future at all. Okay, so uh, egoic means in, organized in terms of ego, our sense of ourselves as uh, composed of various facts, desires, projects, and so on. It's more or less our sense of ourselves that um, I think the best way of thinking about the egoic self is like the self as you would describe yourself on something like a resume. Okay, so that you were born here, here's where you went to high school, here's what you went to college, here's what you majored in, here's what you did, here were your accomplishments, uh, here are your hobbies, and so on. All right, so like that kind of sort of fact or factoid driven sense of self. So uh, transpersonal psychology is going to be examining what lies beyond the territorial self the sense of ourselves organized in terms of ownership, beyond the hierarchically uh, organized sense of ourselves, in other words, organized in terms of stuff we like and stuff we don't like, and uh, where we stand, uh, say, in socially organized pecking orders in terms of sort of gradients of superiority and inferiority, what we're good at, what we're not good at, stuff like that, and the egoic self. All right, so the self-organized in terms of ego, kind of the recipe or resume-driven uh, sense of ourselves. Transpersonal psychology is going to be wondering about what lies beyond all of that. Okay, so what I did to help you get on board with this before we go into some of the concrete ideas about it is because uh, I'm sort of teasing you in a way, you know, with this description because the tease is like, well, what could there be about myself that lies beyond who and what I think I am? <laughs> so it's kind of a teaser a little bit. But before we get into answering the teaser, uh, I thought to help organize this material and help you understand it and get on board with it a little bit more easily, I related to the, it to the stuff that you've already learned about humanistic psychology. So it's sort of compare and contrast type operation for a minute or two in this video. So stuff that transpersonal psychology shares with humanistic psychology. First of all, the element of holism. Okay, and let's sort of remember what that is. So seeing all of what we are as human beings in terms of all of what is in the universe. So let me say that again. Seeing all of what we are in terms of all of what is. Okay, so that's hopefully that's just a moment of memory for you and not a new learning. But if it's a moment of new learning, that means you probably didn't do so well on one of the previous tests, but you can learn it now. Okay, so second thing, the element of authenticity. Right? So this whole business of living toward our deeper potentials and our deeper destiny and self-actualization and all of that. That's another thing that transpersonal psychology is going to share with humanistic psychology. And uh, my computer wants to annoy me. Okay, so uh, snooze wants to restart, but we don't want to restart. Sorry about that. Okay, third thing, the idea that the self is actually something beyond what we normally take it to be. So that's another element that uh, is common to both transpersonal psychology and humanistic psychology. A kind of, um, what? A kind of suspiciousness about the self as a construct, and a, uh, not just a construct in the abstract, but a ongoing way that we define ourselves and our orientation to life. Okay, so uh, fourth thing, the idea that our real selves, who we really are underneath it all, beyond the territorial self, beyond the egoic self, is something that is best revealed in extraordinary experiences, like peak experiences, the way I briefly described them when we were in the Maslow stuff earlier on. To extraordinary experiences, like I say in your notes, of total absorption, like when you're totally absorbed in whatever it is you're doing. It doesn't really matter what it is. Like, let's say you're totally absorbed in studying or you could be totally absorbed in watching this video. That might be uh, an ex uh, one of these experiences. Um, that actually who you are is best revealed in those sorts of experiences and not so much best revealed in terms of sort of the resume that you would give someone or the list of facts about yourself or I guess uh, nowadays you could type stuff on a dating site or something like that or whatever. Tinder? Is, is that right? <laughs> I don't keep track of all that. You reach a certain age and you don't keep track of that kind of stuff. 
Anyhow, so um, extraordinary spiritual peak experiences that, you know, when you're having like an epiphany, like a really uh, deep sense of communion with the universe or com connection with God or something like that, like deep sense of prayer or a deep samadhi experience, like a deep meditative type experience, that those kinds of experiences are better at revealing who we really are than our resumes do you know, or even our internal resumes, right? Like the kind of internal sense of uh, facts you have about yourself in your mind that you construe yourself in terms of, okay? Meditative consciousness, spiritual epiphanies. When our normal self-consciousness has disappeared, like your normal sort of, uh, you know, way of looking at yourself has gone away and all there is is a total absorption, a total flow in the moment. When you're totally flowing in the moment, one of the cool parts about that is that it shows you what you really are, okay? Sort of underneath all the window dressing, it shows you what you ultimately are. So um, I think that's, that's a pretty cool thing. I hope that happens for you every now and then in your life. Maybe I should take a minute to sort of help, this, help you connect with this in a more personal way, like if you... Uh, you know, sometimes this happens for people in sports that they play, like they're in the zone in their sport and they feel like, man, I'm just, you, you can't do anything wrong in whatever your sport is. Or it could happen in anything in life, really. You know, it's like you're fixing your car sometimes. It works on that. You're cooking a meal, if that's your thing. If, uh, you know, you're, you're singing in a rock band and you're really sort of on it, you know, or playing an instrument or, you know, playing music, something like that, or being a student, you know, whatever you got going on in your life, it's possible to turn that into a kind of experience that can show you the deeper latencies of who and what you really are as a human being, the stuff that's normally covered over, but that's there and deep and resonant and powerful and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, and the, finally, the, what is this? The fifth thing that uh, transpersonal psychology shares with humanistic psychology is the idea that spirituality, spirituality is part of the holistic totality of our existence, that we have a spiritual dimension to what we are and that psychology needs to address that, right? Okay, as part of part and parcel of what the human psyche is. And uh, I think I've mentioned once or twice in these videos that actually uh, we get the word psychology from the classical Greek, suke is the, is the classical Greek word, uh, which is the word for soul, all right? So psychology in its sort of deep historical etymological sense is about um, trying to fathom the human soul in a way, which of course, uh, hopefully it gives you a kind of indicator that, hey, there's something spiritual about the task and project of psychology, even if most mainstream psychology doesn't take this particular dimension terribly seriously. Well, the thing is about transpersonalized psychology for sure really does. In fact, I would, I would say that um, probably about three-fourths the time transpersonal psychology is talking about this in one form or another. Humanistic psychology talks about it pretty frequently too, uh, but not three-quarters of the time. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, one-quarter of the time or something like that. But they both share this emphasis on spirituality as part of the holistic totality of human existence. Okay, so those are the compare. Those are the things they have in common. Now let's do the contrast side of the equation. So how are humanistic and transpersonal psychologies different from one another? Well, I kind of just said the first way that, okay, they, they share an emphasis on spirituality and spiritual experience, but transpersonal psychology is going to be way more focused on it. Okay, so for humanistic psychology, it's one important element of the holistic totality. But for transpersonal psychology, it's, it's definitely <laughs> kind of the most important element of things. So uh, the transpersonal is, uh, psychology is definitely going to be seeking to integrate that into psychology. And it understands um, spirituality, since we're using that term in kind of a loose and approximate way, I guess, so far. Um, transpersonal psychology sees spirituality in terms of an integration of Eastern and Western 
practices and modalities. So it's not going to be deferring too easily, let's say, to a Christian concept only of what spirituality is about. And it's not going to be deferring too easily to a purely, let's say, Buddhist conception of what spirituality is about. What it's seeking out is an integration of both the Western sensibility and the Eastern sensibility. Okay, so it's important to know that. All right, so Western views such as prayer, Christian mysticism, and contemplative practice. That's how I said it in your notes. Eastern views such as Hinduism, Buddhism, meditative practice. And that's why uh, within the curriculum here at West Georgia, uh, these two areas uh, are integrated in one course. Okay, so the course is Psychology 4130. It's usually taught by Alan Pope, who oddly enough, was back in the day uh, my erstwhile roommate in graduate school. Strange how sort of fate or destiny works sometimes. So I've known him for, what is it now, 34 years? Oh my God, 34 years. That's over a third of a century. Did I really say that? Yeah, I did, but it's true. Anyhow, um, back in the day, like he taught me how to play chess. He was a real good chess player and I taught him how to play electric guitar. So we sort of traded things. He taught me how to meditate too. So that was like a really cool thing because he was into that. Anyhow, that's a little sidebar moment, I suppose. Uh, psychology 4130 is entitled Eastern and Transpersonal Psychology. And hopefully you're inferring from the title of that course that these two areas are definitely going to be fairly well connected. So. Yeah, they are. And probably as we proceed through not just the videos for transpersonal psychology, but the videos that are going to follow that, which are going to have to do with Eastern forms of psychology, you'll really start to get a sense for that over time. Okay, I want to end this video here because this is a logical break point. Uh, what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to look at a bunch of thinkers in the transpersonal psychological tradition. Once again, as usual, notice some of their big ideas, some of their more salient vocabulary uh, with an eye toward helping you get used to uh, what this transpersonal psychology stuff is about so you can figure out if it's, hey, if this is your thing or not, at least you'll have some data to base that decision upon. In any case, I hope you have a great day, hope you have a wonderful one, and I guess I'll be seeing you, or you'll be seeing me, a little bit later uh, with video number two in this series. So take care and have a good one.